Welcome to this podcast. Uh, this is entitled Overview of Computational Science. This is part of the NCSSM online program. What we're going to try to discuss in this particular talk is we'll talk a little bit about the nature of science. We're going to try to define uh, what we mean by the term computational science and we will, you'll see that we will define it specifically as the um, use of uh, or define it as being in the application, the algorithm, and the architecture. We're also going to talk a little bit about the associative law of computational science and how that plays into the work you're going to be doing in this particular course. We're going to talk about what they what are known as the grand challenge equations and the grand challenge problems. We're going to talk a little bit about one of the support disciplines that we find in the field of computational science, that being the area entitled scientific visualization or SciViz for short. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about who does computational science and most importantly, if you have intentions on becoming a research scientist, who pays for computational science work. So this is a, a rough and very brief outline of what we're going to try to do in this particular talk. Uh, we want to start out by talking about the nature of science and as the graphic over on the right hand side says, science is really the study of how nature behaves. And the graphic suggests that there are three components or three types of, of science. I'm actually going to add a fourth. So we're going to start with what we call observational science. All of you have been making observations your entire life, but observational science is probably the foundational or fundamental way of doing science. And there are people who do observational science uh, for their entire career. The most, probably the most well-known example is Jane Goodall, who uh, spent lots of time in the jungles of Africa observing primates. She didn't do experiments on them, she didn't come up with theories, she didn't build computer models of primates, she made observations in the field. When most people think about science, they think about experimental science or doing experimentation and this is typically, again, most people envision this as there being a chemistry lab or a physics lab or a biology lab and people are in there with their white coats on and, and doing experiments with test tubes and beakers and, and animals and all those types of things and that's typically what people consider to be experimentation and experimental science is typically hypothesis driven meaning you have a hypothesis you're trying to test that hypothesis to see whether or not it's false or not um, and there's usually an independent variable and a dependent variable, the independent variable being the thing that you are manipulating or changing, the dependent variable meaning the thing that changes as a result of what you did. So in experimentation we have you know, your independent variable, dependent variable, you have a control group and a very specific process for the most part on how you do experimentation. So most people think about science in terms of experimental science. One of the big areas of science is theoretical science or theory and the classic example of a theoretical scientist is Albert Einstein who basically did thought experiments. He was able to think about uh, how nature behaves and he was able to think about that pretty much without doing any experiments. So he didn't have particularly have a lab, he didn't go out in the field and make observations, he thought about things and he represented his thoughts with very complicated and complex mathematical equations. So these three types of science, observation, experiment, and theory, these have been the foundation or bedrock of modern science since uh, the beginning of, of what we now define as science. But in the past 50, 60 years or so, actually in very recent times, there's been a, a fourth type of science and that of course is computational science uh, and that is uh, because there is computational science, that is why you are able uh, and why there is a need to teach a course such as Introduction to Computational Chemistry. And so we're going to talk a lot in this presentation about what computational science is, a little bit about what it isn't, and we'll go from there. Okay, so let's jump right in there. What is computational science? It's an interdisciplinary field, and that's an important thing for you to remember. 
um, is that it, it typically when one is doing computational science, one is doing it in a in a team-based environment, in a collaborative environment. It's an interdisciplinary field, and it really uh, integrates three disciplines, science, mathematics, and computer science. So let me talk real quickly about what uh, the difference between computer science and computational science. Computer science people, uh, and again, I'm over uh, simplifying a little bit, but computer science people are typically concerned with one or of two things, how to make better hardware, how to make better physical computers, and so they are hardware computer scientists, and the second group are software computer scientists. They're concerned with, you know, how to make better programs, how to write better code, how to get more speed out of a computer. Uh, and uh, as you see from this slide right here, and let me put the graphic up, computational science really is at the intersection of computer science, mathematics, and applied disciplines, uh, chemistry, physics, biology type of thing. So typically when you are doing computational science, uh, you have a team of people. You have the scientists, chemists, biologists, physicists, whatever the case may be. You have a mathematician and you have a computer scientist. And that typically is what you will find on a computational science research team. The scientist has to know enough mathematics to be able to talk to the mathematician. The mathematician has to know enough science to be able to talk to the scientist, and all of them need to be able to talk to the computer scientist who will be the one who typically will generate the codes uh, that uh, the scientist will use to solve the particular problem. So it's an interdisciplinary field. Um, getting a little bit, drilling down a little deeper into this notion of application, algorithm, and architecture, and you notice there uh, each of the three disciplines, science, math, and computing, represented there. So we call application, we refer to that as the science. So in the, your particular case, uh, if you're taking the introduction to computational chemistry, your application or your scientific focus area is quantum chemistry. That's the focus of this course. If you're taking the medicinal chemistry course, your application or your focus science area is pharmacology, computational drug design. So that would be your application area. Okay. All of that is what we have to be able to do is take that science, and we'll show you some examples here in a moment. You ha we have to be able to take that science and represent it algorithmically. We have to be able to convert it into a mathematical model. Then we have to be able to take that algorithm and put it onto, into some computing environment or architecture that will allow us to actually uh, run or solve the mathematical model. And this next slide shows pretty much the same thing. This is just a little bit different viewpoint of it. So again, the application is the scientific focus. In our case, it's chemistry, or if you're in MedChem, it's drug design. The algorithm is the mathematical model, so we have to be able to, again, talk about the science mathematically. So in uh, these courses, uh, you will learn uh, some amount of mathematics, not too much, but enough that you can understand what the computer is doing. And then the third part, of course, is the architecture, which is known as the computing environment. So you see here in the, the uh, tetrahedral or sort of pyramid model there on the right, that computation, experiment, and theory, um, all of those three things influence what the model is and what the model looks like. And the, the base of the model is the application, the algorithm, and the architecture or computing environment. So we typically talk about the computer model. A lot of times, by the way, you'll hear the term, uh, uh, for computational science, you'll hear scientific computing. You'll also hear the term model, model and simulation. If people say they are a computer modeler, um, that will sometimes mean that they are a computational scientist. Sometimes they, that also may mean that they do things like they do uh, three-dimensional graphics design. So sometimes we call those people computer modelers as well. So it's a, the terminology gets a little loose at times. All right, let's talk a little bit about applications. Again, if you're in the Introduction to Computational Chemistry course, uh, your main application is chemistry, and you're basically going to be doing two things. You're going to be doing electronic structure determinations. You're going to be trying to determine 
where the electrons are in a particular atom or a molecule, and based on knowing where those electrons are, you'll be able to say something intelligent about, about the chemical. Uh, this is also, you heard me use the term computational quantum chemistry. Uh, fundamentally, in the, in the intro to CompCam course, you're doing quantum mechanical calculations. In the medicinal chemistry course, you'll be using uh, these tools to help you make some intelligent statements about uh, how well a particular molecule might work as a drug. Okay, so this is what we're doing in the, so an awful lot of computational chemistry in both the CompChem course and the MedChem course, and it's all quantum mechanics and electronic structure determinations. Uh, so again, this leads to properties of chemical structures, properties and activities, what I call SPA, and you'll hear lots about SPA in the next uh, several podcasts. In physics, the sort of the two main areas are astrophysics and cosmology. We use computational modeling because it's pretty hard to study a galaxy. They're pretty big and pretty far away, but we can build computer models of them. We can build, uh, we can have a computational solution to the study of a of galaxy formation, how the universe is formed. So physics people use computational study uh, studies a, a tremendous amount. Um, in biology, what we know is computational biology. Uh, the primary use of computing in biology is genome analysis. We actually have a program that we're doing here at residentially with the Jackson Genomics Lab in Bar Harbor, Maine, where a group of four research students, residential research students here, are involved in a year-long program in the area of computational biology, and they're doing uh, computational analyses of mouse genetics. Uh, the, the medicinal chemistry folks will do uh, several weeks' worth of computational biology. We typically don't do this, of course, in the comp chem course. Uh, environmental science, you're reading a lot these days about global warming models, and that's all done computationally. So all of the environmental impact uh, studies are all being done computationally. Medicine, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, drug design and development, an awful lot of drug design now uh, is being done computationally, so that's a huge application area. Uh, we have students here in the research and computational science program that's offered residentially that are doing computational linguistics. They're doing analysis of linguistic patterns. I have one student who's doing a computational linguistic analysis of hieroglyphics through uh, a research lab at Duke University. Pretty neat stuff. In economics, there's what's known as the Adam Smith models. You'll hear about these on, on the news. These are the models that are used to forecast uh, economic conditions, uh, and you're probably hearing some about these uh, given the, the current economic situation. Okay, in terms of algorithms, okay, uh, this is also what's known as the mathematical model. I'm sorry the equations popped up ahead of the, the words here. Uh, but basically, we must be able to convert some scientific principle into a solvable mathematical equation. And in both the CompChem and the MedChem course, you're primarily going to be solving Schrodinger's equation, and it's represented by that uh, funky-looking H psi equals E psi uh, equation over to the right of the word Schrodinger. I've also represented the Schrodinger equation in a little different format. You see some similarities. It's represented in a little different format below. And yes, we will get into some of the mathematics of this equation, especially in the CompChem course. In the MedChem course, we tend to uh, do a little bit more hand-waving with some of the uh, quantum mechanical calculations. Those of you who are taking both CompChem and MedChem will have a little better understanding of what the, the mathematics is. Uh, but primarily, we must be able to must be able to solve this algorithm. And again, what the, the, the software that we have on the CompChem server does is it actually solves these very complicated mathematical equations, okay? And that's an important thing. And to solve these algorithms or solve these equations, we must use, or we typically use, a variety of numerical methods. And we'll talk about that now. So I'm going to do that by giving you an example. If I ask you x squared minus 4 equals 0, I imagine most of you would be able to, in your head, be able to figure out that x is either 2 or minus 2. So if I take, if I put a 2 in for x, 2 squared is 4, 4 minus 4 is 0. Um, negative 2 squared is 4, 4 minus 4 again is 0. But if I give you this uh, equation, uh, 
15x to the fifth minus 4x to the third, so on and so forth, equals zero. I think you probably have a little bit more challenging time trying to determine what x is. You probably could not do this one in your head. So uh, if you should see some similarities between these two equations, they both have a x variable in them, and both of them are equal to zero. And, and because of that, they are what's known as roots equations. Well, uh, solving the roots algorithm or a roots equation uh, can be difficult to do. So how do we solve that? Uh, one way is to use a numerical method called Newton's method, named after Sir Isaac Newton. And this is what's known as an iterative technique, meaning it is a technique that repeats itself. So it's a set of mathematics that repeats itself. And the way this works is we start with an initial guess. So for example, with the 15 next to the fifth equation here, I might say, well, I think x is 23. And so I would start this repeating um, uh, numerical method with x being equal to 23, and then I would let the math uh, repeat itself around and around until I have what's called a convergence, meaning it, it, the number stops changing and I have a solution that, that converges. And uh, you're going to hear the word, or you'll see the word convergence failure of, uh, fairly often in computational chemistry because this is, while we're not using Newton's method, we're using algorithms that need, that are iterative, that go round and round and round until they think they have the right answer. And if they think they have the right answer, they stop and say, this is what I think the right answer is. But oftentimes they can go round and round and round and never converge, never stop at what they think is the right answer. And you'll get a message in your output that says convergence failure and you'll need to learn how to deal with that. So in the homework for the Comp Chem students, uh, we're going to ask you to actually code by hand a uh, spreadsheet version of Newton's method. You'll have a chance to get a chance to see what that looks like from a nitty-gritty approach. Okay, in terms of architecture, again, this is the computing environment. It's comprised of both the hardware, the physical machine, and the software, the programs running on it. So, for example, the North Carolina Computational Chemistry Server is a power Dell uh, workstation. That's the physical machine. The software running on it is it runs the, it's a Unix machine that runs the WebMO interface to the computational chemistry environment. And the software on it are, uh, are currently Gaussian 03, Mopac, Games, and Tinker. Okay, so that's the computing environment. We care a lot about compute power. Uh, both the ComCam and the MedCam folks are going to hear about, um, oh, we don't have enough compute power to do a computational analysis of some particular model. And one of the ways we measure compute power is what's known as a flop, otherwise known as a floating point operation per second. So basically, this represents a flop is a single mathematical calculation. So 4 plus 2 equals 6 that would be considered one floating point operation. And one measure of compute power is how many of those mathematical equations can we do in one second. And we can rate machines. Uh, there are megaflop machines, gigaflop machines, teraflop machines, and pentaflop machines. Mega being uh, million, giga, billion, tera, uh, trillion, and pentaflop, that's 10 to the 15th. So a uh, a gigaflop machine basically does a billion mathematical calculations per second. And so we can rate machines. Your desktop, your laptop, or your desktop machine is probably a megaflop machine, depending on uh, how much money you paid for it. Okay. We can also rate machines. And again, they're sort of an, uh, it's related to the mega, giga, tera, pentaflop. But uh, we also rate machines as being this is a desktop computer or a personal computer. There are what's known as workstations. Uh, which are more powerful machines. Basically, the North Carolina High School Computational Chemistry Server is fundamentally a workstation. There are clustered workstations, which means we take a whole bunch of these workstations and we sort of link them all together so they talk to each, each other, and basically they behave as one big machine. And then there's what we call supercomputers, and a supercomputer is uh, defined as whatever the fastest machine is at any given time. So. The, the, this MacBook that I have sitting in front of me uh, 25 years ago would have been considered a supercomputer. Right now it's considered a, you know, uh, a MacBook. 
Uh, so that's how supercomputers are defined by whatever the fastest machine might be. We use the term HPC to mean high performance computing, and typically we use that term for clustered workstations, supercomputers, or large machines that are used by a lot of people. So uh, I will sometimes advertise myself or introduce myself as an HPC professional. Uh, I come from the supercomputing community, so I've been working in high performance computing now for since uh, about 1987 or so. Uh, we also uh, euphemistically refer to HPC as big iron. So uh, you'll hear me say, oh, you're trying to do some calculation on this mercury compound. Uh, the North Carolina machine doesn't have enough compute power to deal with that. You need some big iron, and that means you're going to have to go find some other resource. So again, the North Carolina uh, High School Computational Chemistry Server, we call that the NCSSM computer. That's a workstation. Uh, we also have access to a... Uh, a big, big workstation. I would almost call it a mini supercomputer at East Carolina University. And for purposes of this course, that's our HPC machine. And if I say, oh, this problem needs big iron, that should be a, a clue to you that you need something other than the North Carolina High School Computational Chemistry Server. And your option in this case will be the ECU machine. Those of you, I have students here doing research and sometimes we need to access uh, a real supercomputer at a supercomputing center like the one in Illinois or San Diego. The medicinal chemistry students will use supercomputers uh, literally all over the world. We'll use the San Diego one, the Illinois one. We'll use a couple over in London. We'll use one in Washington, D.C. So we'll, you'll have a chance to use uh, real supercomputers in the med chem course. All right, um, I want to talk real briefly about what I, it's sort of tongue-in-cheek, known as the associative law of computational science. And there's two ways that you can think about using computers in science. Some of you will become science researchers. You will do research in chemistry. You will do research in drug design. You will do research in physics. You will do research in mathematics. And the first part of the, you notice where the parentheses are here, um, the main focus is scientific research, and that's what's inside the parentheses. Outside of the parentheses is the word computational. So what this is trying to convey is that you will use computational methods to do your scientific research. You don't really care how the computer is doing what it is you need done. All you care is that the computer is helping you do the science that you are trying to do, whether it's, again, chemistry or physics or biology or mathematics or linguistics, whatever the case may be. But there's another way if you move the parentheses, and I'm sure that's what, that's what the associative law means. Some of you uh, will want to do research on computational science. So what this means is your research will pay attention to um, how can we come up with better algorithms to represent, for example, can we come up with a better algorithm other than the Schrodinger equation to help us say smart things about the electronic structure of a molecule. Some of you will do research on um, how can we make this computer program go faster on this particular uh, piece of hardware. And yes, that's sort of bleeding over into the area of, co of computer science, uh, but those uh, divisions are pretty blurred these days. So you may be a computational scientist that's focusing mostly on computer science or vice versa. So um, in this particular course, uh, in the Comp Chem course, uh, if you replace the word science with chemistry, uh, what we're going to do more of the one on the bottom than the one on the top. We're going to spend more time teaching you about computational chemistry and a little bit of the time using computers to do chemistry uh, studies or chemistry research. In the med chem course, it's pretty much the opposite. We're going to use computers. Sometimes there'll be a black box. We really won't know what the computer is doing. But in the med chem course, we're going to use computers to do research on new drugs. Okay, so the com chem course is mostly focused on the bottom one. The med chem course is mostly focused on the top one. Okay, that's the associative law. There exist in the computational chemistry field what are known as the grand challenge problems. Uh, I have a typo there. It should say problem, not problem. 
And these are problems that are, that are mostly or significantly solved computationally, meaning they're typically not problems that you're going to solve in a traditional chemistry or physics laboratory. Uh, they are also typically what we call computationally intensive, meaning these are problems that really require a supercomputer or really require a high performance computing environment, or again, euphemistically, they really require big iron uh, to be able to solve these. Some examples of these are putting a man on, on Mars. That's a computationally intensive problem trying to model uh, mathematically and computationally all of the aspects of getting the rocket off Earth into Mars or orbit, landing on Mars, getting people back safely. That's a grand challenge problem. Uh, we just, uh, we are, uh, we've completed mapping the human genome, so all the genes in the human body. Now the next big grand challenge is to map the human proteome, meaning to be able to computationally map uh, all of the pro uh, proteins that are found in the human body. So that's a grand challenge problem. Building an accurate model of the human brain, so cognitive or computational neuroscience is a grand challenge problem. Uh, you read a lot about nanotechnologies, very small technologies. All of that is being done computationally. UNC Chapel Hill, by the way, is a big center for nanotechnology science, so they have computational chemists. Uh, you swing a cat, and you're going to hit a computational chemist over there. Uh, and then uh, one of the old traditional grand challenge problems is accurate weather prediction, being able to predict the weather computationally uh, without the use or uh, based on the use of tools like satellites and things that we, we currently have. Okay, just uh, uh, there's also what's known as the grand challenge equations, and I show a couple of them here. Newton's equation, a little different than the Newton's method that I showed earlier, and you might be able to read this slide here. It's a fundamental equation of classical mechanics, and some of you may recognize the F equals MA notation. This is a little bit uh, more complicated and complex form that you're seeing here. The next one down is the Schrodinger equation. Again, this is one of the more complicated forms of this. This is the time-dependent uh, form, but this is the basic equation of quantum mechanics. For uh, ev almost everything you do in the comp chem and med chem course, you're going to be solving Schrodinger's equation. The good news is that you don't have to do this by hand. You don't do this with a uh, TI-89 calculator. Needless to say, the mathematics is way too difficult, which is why we need computers to help us solve this equation. The Navier-Stokes equation, that's the primary equation of computational fluid dynamics. So if I want to design a new aircraft or a new ship, I want to do weather prediction, I want to do climate modeling, I would use Navier-Stokes equation uh, to do that particular work. And here's another, I thought this was just a really cool looking picture. Here's all of the grand challenge equations, and you see the grand challenge equations, and this should suggest to you that you need to pay attention in math class. And the, the key or the code for what these, uh, the different equations are down there in the bottom, and I encourage you to uh, look at that, and your eyeballs will probably glaze right over. But we'll be solving some of those, including Schrodinger's equation, in this particular course, both CompCam and MedCam. Okay, there's a, a support discipline. Uh, it's a discipline in and of itself, meaning people go to school uh, to learn how to, how to do this. It's called scientific visualization. And when you do computational calculations, you don't get one number as an answer. You don't get two numbers. You get a fire hose of data. You get a flood of data. You get millions, billions, and trillions of uh, pieces of data, and that's the answer to your problem. And it's, you just can't make sense of that much data. You can't look at millions, billions, trillions of numbers and make sense of what's happening. So what you have to do is you have to be able to render or convert this data into some sort of understandable or analyzable form. And so scientific visual, visualization is, I lost the bullet here, is basically the taking of this scientific data and being able to render it or convert it into some sort of form that I can look at or analyze and make, make some sense of. Okay, so let me give you an example here. Here's an example, and this is a, just a fraction of a screenshot of a data set that I generated computationally. And you can look at this data, you can stare at this data, and you can maybe see some patterns or stuff. You can see a couple places where there's some little bit more white space and 
the sevens are a little bit lighter than the nines and a little bit lighter than the twos. So you could sort of make out some sort of pattern here, but I'm willing to bet you can't really make any sense of this data. Well, if I run this data through a scientific visualization software package or, an, or a SciViz sci engine, okay, uh, what I get, so there's what this data represents, is I drew a picture of a frog with the, the sentence, how do I look? And that's what these numbers represent. So you see the numbers on the left, and when I rendered these numbers into a visualized form, I get this sort of dorky looking frog uh, that has the sentence, how do I look on there? So uh, uh, being able to do that is an important part of computational science. This next slide, I just did a, a Google search on scientific visualization, and then I did a screen snapshot of the first uh, uh, two rows of images that I see here. So you see on the uh, top left, you see some computational fluid dynamics. Uh, you see some, actually some art. Uh, these are fractals over there. Uh, the Science Daily one is, I think this is a protein structure. Uh, you see some plasma there, that green, the blog spot there. You see some proteins on the far top right. Um, uh, on the bottom left, I think you see some neurons. The, obviously, you see the hurricane there. Uh, the middle one uh, on the bottom, that's a, a computational chemistry molecule. You, they see the foot there, uh, that's all been generated computationally, and then you just see sort of a window over on the bottom right from Berkeley that shows a, a piece of scientific visualization software. Uh, the, uh, the, the good thing for you is for the, both the CompChem and the MedChem course is when you run a job on the CompChem server is it automatically has a built-in scientific visualization program for you, so it generates the numbers for you and then immediately converts them into a, uh, an image that you can rotate. So you actually get to see a visualized representation of the molecule and all the relevant data. Okay? So it's built into uh, Gaussian 03 or MOPAC, the tools you're going to use. All right, so who does all this? And more importantly, who pays for this? Uh, fundamentally, computational science is an integral part of every major and minor research endeavor in the world. You will find very few scientific research labs that don't have somebody in there doing some sort of computational science work. Uh, in the U.S., the primary groups that are doing this are the NSF, the National Science Foundation, uh, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, uh, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, DOE, which is the Department of Energy, uh, Department of Defense. They typically have the most advanced supercomputers. DOD gets the... Um, because they're trying to uh, build computer models of the battlefield. They typically have the, the most powerful supercomputers of any uh, federal agency anyway. Uh, NASA certainly does, has a lot of computational science going on. Uh, every major university uh, is doing computational science. You can actually get a degree in computational science and computational chemistry, computational biology, computational physics, so those are becoming degree programs. Uh, every major research lab, as I mentioned above, uh, all of these folks are doing computational science in a really big way. So uh, the job market is wide open, uh, and the fact that you're learning how to do this as a high school student is a huge deal because you're going to go into uh, the university as a freshman, and you are going to be a computationally knowledgeable uh, student. And that's going to be a... a uh, a pretty good commodity and you, that you should be able to translate that into finding a position in a research lab at the undergraduate level. Okay, if you have any questions, we'll talk about those during the video conference and look forward to seeing you all soon.